were there really giants in Bible times? And if so, what is their spiritual significance? We're going to look at that in this video. We're going to start a series about giants in the Bible. And sure enough, the Bible records giants. And we're all very familiar with Goliath, the giant whose height was six cubits in a span, which equates to three meters or nine feet, nine inches. We may not be so familiar with Og, the king of Bashan, one of the nations in the promised land. He was a, a giant as well. He was of the remnant of the giants. And the Bible doesn't tell us his size, but it does tell us his bed was nine cubits long and four cubits wide. And when you convert that, it's about four meters long and almost two meters wide, which is 13 feet, six inches long as a bed. And let's say the bed's slightly bigger than him, that would make him enormous. And there's also several other giants mentioned in the Bible. And we're going to look at that in the upcoming videos. There's the Nephilim, or the giants in the days before Noah. There was giants in the promised land that Israel inherited. And we, of course, know about Goliath and Og. Please consider subscribing to this channel to follow this series on giants in the Bible. Now, some people might doubt if there is, was ever giants, but there's archaeological evidence, the giant of Castleknow, he was, they looked at his skeleton, 3.5 meters or 11 feet, 6 inches. Robert Wadlow, in the early 20th century, there's a picture of him. He was almost 3 meters tall, he was 8 feet, 11 inches. He lived in Illinois, United States. There's many other references on the internet if you'd like to look at other giants. Fyodor Machnow, one of the most famous giants, there's a picture of him here, he lived in Belarus. He was 9 feet 3 inches tall, or almost 3 meters. He was just a few inches smaller than Goliath. Before we move on in the study, we have to understand that the Bible is truth. Everything in the Bible is truthful. We see, for example, John 17, 17, sanctify them, set God's people apart, make them holy through thy truth. Jesus prayed this prayer, thy word is truth. The word of God is truth, and that's how Christians become sanctified or made holy. Jesus Christ is truth, John 14, 6, the Holy Spirit is truth, John 15, 26. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And when we interpret the Bible, which is highly symbolic, by the way, and it's completely spiritual, it's not a history lesson. It's not just for fun facts. To interpret the Bible, we compare spiritual with spiritual. And we know that Jesus' words are spirit and they are life because Jesus is the Word of God. It's by the Spirit of Christ that the Bible was written. We know that the Bible's written precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That's how we interpret the Bible. We go through the Bible. We compare Scripture with Scripture. The Scripture is spiritual. We compare spiritual with spiritual. Okay, so now let's look at the giants in the Bible. We see the word giant, when we find it in the Bible or the King James Bible, it's actually three separate Hebrew words, Nephilim, Anakim, and Rephaim, and they all interrelate, they all quote each other and, and point to each other, but there's three particular terms, and we're going to look at those. Nephilim, we may recall, are, is the word used in the story of Noah's flood, and it's talking about these mighty giants, these mighty men, men of renown. The Anakim were those that they're equated to the Nephilim in Numbers 13:33. And they were in the promised land that Israel was to inherit. Joshua, which is a symbol for Jesus Christ, drove out the Anakim except in Gath. And of course we know in Gath, that's where Goliath is from. And Goliath is a Rephaim giant. He's referred to as a Rephaim. And we see that, that they're equated though to Anakim. So both Goliath and Og, the king of Bashan, are both Rephaim. But all of them, the King James Version of the Bible rep, translates all these words as giants because all these words point to each other. They, they relate to each other. They, they, they're used in the same context. But they, and they're translated as giants. And, and it's valid because we know that King Og and Goliath were huge, 
huge people, and that's why the translators translated them as giants. Okay, Nephilim giants, primarily the importance of that word Nephilim is that it means to make to fall down. It's somebody that's powerful, that can, that can be victorious. And we see it's used in the days of Noah. There was giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God, which represents God's people, came to the daughters of men, which represents people that are not God's people, and they bare children, they same became mighty men. They were of all men of renown. And, and we see right the next verse, God saw that wickedness of man was great in the earth. Every imagination and thoughts of his heart was on evil continually. When that led to the flood, we're going to look at that. It's a the days of Noah are a type of the days, the great tribulation prior to the second coming of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at that in more detail, the giants, in the next video. So please consider subscribing. But Nephilim are the first of the types of giants. After the Nephilim, we see the Anakim giants. They were primarily featured in the promised land, in the land of Canaan, on the west side of the Jordan River. They were Anakim. They, they, were, they were there. Anakim literally means a chain or a necklace. They were a people great and tall, the children of the Anakims, whom you know and of whom you've heard say, who can stand before the children of Anak? They were powerful. They were big because they were giants. Numbers 13, 28, the people be strong, they're mighty, they're strong, who dwell in the land. The cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak in there, the children of Anak there. And then a couple verses later, there we saw the giants, which is that, that Hebrew word Nephilim, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. They're related to the Nephilim. They're the ones that came after the flood. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in the in their sight. The sons of Anak, the Anakim, are also considered Nephilim. They're considered giants, and we're going to look at this in an upcoming video. Finally, the Rephium giants, they primarily were the, in the land of Moab and Ammon on the east side of the Jordan River, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. They're related to the Anakins, which are also accounted giants as the Anakims, and that word giant there is Rephium. That was also counted as a land of giants, Rephium. Giants, Rephium, dwelt there in old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamzumans. And they're great, they're many, they're tall. And an example of a Rephium is Og, the king of Bashan, on the east side of the Jordan River. But also Goliath in 1 Chronicles 20 and his family were Rephium giants. And they were on the western edge of the Promised Land, right on the Mediterranean Sea. We're going to cover this in more detail in upcoming videos. Again, please subscribe. There's a little red button in the bottom right hand corner. And let's move on in this study. Now that we have a background on giants in the Bible, we want to look at what's important for us, which is the spiritual significance of what these giants represent. And who in the world are the giants today? And they're not physically giant today, but there are plenty of giants today that we deal with in our lives and in our world. And we're going to find out in the next few slides that giants are symbolic. They're the adversary of God's people. These are proud people. They're mighty in human ability. They're famous people. They're men of renown. First, let's look at this idea about giants being men of renown. And that word, men of renown, that we find about the giants in the days of Noah, Genesis 6, 4, there were giants in the earth in those days. The same became mighty men, mighty, powerful men, which were of old, men of renown. Men of renown literally means it means men of name. It means people that have become famous. Their name is famous. The people that were mighty men, they, they, became, they were so mighty that word traveled. People heard about them, just like today, just like the people that we hear about today, all the day, time in the news and the media, everywhere, in sports, entertainment, politics, religion, etc. It's these men of renown. It's these powerful, worldly, godly, proud, arrogant people. Men of renown we see in Genesis 11, 4, the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel. The people said, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. Let's exalt. Let's go up. Let's be big. And let us make us a name. Let's become famous. 
lest we be scattered abroad about the face of the whole earth. They wanted to group together. They wanted to become famous that they're the greatest. They're reaching into heaven. We also see in a positive sense, for example, good King David, he had fame because of his goodness. Just like Jesus Christ has a name because of his greatness and his perfection and that he's God. The fame of David went about all the lands and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all the nations. Similar to Solomon, he was wiser than all men, 1 Kings 4. His fame, and again, this is all the same word that's used in Genesis 6, 4, men of renown. Solomon's fame was in all nations round about. And again, today it's the politicians, it's the media, it's the entertainers, the sports figures, business people, the leaders in business, and religious people, civic leaders, and the list continues. There's giants today, they're famous people, they're men of renown. And we see that these men of renown, they, they are mighty people. They're mighty people. They're, they're scary. They're intimidating. Just like we saw in the promised land, the people were great and many and tall as the Anakims, which were accounted giants. People, the, Israel was intimidated by that. They had a name. They were famous. The people great and tall, the children of the Anakims. Again, Genesis 6, 4, they were men of renown. They were mighty men. The, these men of renown were mighty. They were powerful. They had great works and ability to do things. Deuteronomy 1.28, the people looking to go into the promised land, they were discouraged. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our heart. We're afraid. They're, they're too good for us. They're too mighty. They're too powerful. How can I ever stand up to them? The people is greater and taller than we. And we've seen the sons of Anakin. The giants are there. We just can't do it because of their great human ability. And we see a very interesting parallel passage to this. That Saul, Saul was the first king of Israel. And guess what Israel did? That's who they chose. That's who they wanted to be their king. Because he was a tall person. He's not called a giant, but he's a tall person. First Samuel 8. The people said, make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. The Lord said, hearken unto the voice of people. And all they say, they have not rejected thee. They have rejected me that I should not reign over them. The people of Israel wanted a real king, not God. They wanted some, some king that will be powerful and lead them. First Samuel 9, 2. And they, picked, they found Saul. His name was Saul, a choice young man and goodly. There was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he from his shoulders and upward his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people that's at least a foot higher than other people he was a large person he's not called a giant but again he was tall he was big the people looked at him he has the ability he's the biggest one he must be the strongest he must be the best it's symbolic of of people being intimidated by somebody's what they do in the flesh First Samuel 10, when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from the shoulders and upwards. And Samuel said to all the people, see, see ye him who the Lord has chosen that there is none like him among all the people. And the people shouted, God save the king. God save our king. They loved it because he was a large person. There was something in the flesh that attracted him. And that's what happens today with all type of leaders that we have in this world today. There's something about them that attracts us to them, their size, their ability, their, their, their all type of, maybe they're politicians, leaders of all types. Okay, but Saul, Saul, he had human ability. He was tall and he was goodly, but he was disobedient. He was prideful and he was very prideful. We're going to find that the tall giants are also prideful. But let's look at Saul for now. Saul commanded, was commanded to utterly destroy all the Amalekites and the herds. But Saul and the people spared Agag, the best of the sheep and oxen. He was absolutely, instead of destroying all the Am Am Amalekites and the herds, he saved the king and he saved the best of the sheep, oxen, lambs, all that was good. He would not utterly destroy him. He was absolutely dis disobedient to God. And it was because his pride. Saul thought he knew better than God. God told him to destroy everything. He decided, well, let me keep all the good stuff. I'll save the king's life and I'll save all the, the good herds. He thought he was better than God. It's the pride. 
He was this tall, goodly person, the leader of Israel, and he thinks he's better than God. Samuel said to Saul, when you were little in thine own sight, were you not made the head of the tribes of Israel? Wherefore then you did not obey the voice of the Lord. Before he was king, he was little in his own sight. He was humbled. But when he became king, he's, he's, he's tall and he's proud. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king. And that's what happened because he, in his pride, in Saul's pride, he was disobedient to the word of God. And when we think about the worldly leaders today, they're ungodly, by and large, ungodly people that people idolize because of their physical abilities. But God chooses the humble David as king. That it wasn't the eldest son of Jesse chosen king, but it's the youngest one, David, that last son. But the Lord said, look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature. David wasn't tall. He was like an average person. Because I have refused him, for the Lord sees not as, sees not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance. Man looks at the size of somebody, their ability, their ability to sing or to perform or to entertain or to carry a ball or whatever. Or, or give a speech as a politician or, or twist things and things like that. But God looks on the heart. David was the youngest of these eight brothers. Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before to Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Samuel said to Jesse, are here all thy, are here all thy children? He said, yet there remains the youngest, but he, he just keeps the sheep. He's that humble one out there watching the sheep. The youngest one. And David, as we know, we're going to find out, is that type of Jesus Christ. The Psalms use David in the first person, and it's quoted as referring to Jesus Christ. He's a type of Jesus Christ. In this world, people praise the people that are mighty, the people that are famous, the people that are strong, the people that have special abilities. All of this has to do with the flesh. Everything we see is in the flesh, in this world. But that's not what the way God looks at it. Just like he looked at David versus King Saul, he saw David as a humble king, a type of Jesus Christ. God chooses the weak to shame the mighty. 1 Corinthians 1, 27, God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. There's a lot of people in this world that have all type of doctoral degrees and advanced degrees and all type of, they, they build themselves up that they are the, a doctor of, of psychologies and all this other stuff, which is all completely contrary to the word of God. But God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Those people that think they're wise, God has also chosen the weak things, the people that don't have the money, don't have the power. But he chooses them to confound the things which are mighty, those famous people, those people with all the abilities and all the praise and all the glory. We see in Luke 16, 15, that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Those people that walk around proudly saying, well, I am the leader of this, or I, I am this, and I am do, can do that, and I won this, and, and I can have this ability, and they're leaders in politics and everything else. They're highly esteemed. People think that they're, they're, they're great. They think they're some type of savior. That which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. God values the humble in spirit. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though they join hand in hand, they will not be unpunished. They join hand in hand. They group together. They all pat each other on the back. But they will be punished because they are proud in heart, which is an abomination in the eyes of God. Okay, finally, and very importantly, we want to see that the Hebrew words for tall and height or high, those words are used also to for pride. They're also translated as pride. We've looked at Deuteronomy. The people was greater and taller. The Anakims, which are the giants, they were great and tall. That word tall there, it's the Hebrew word rum, R-U-M which literally means to be high, raised up or exalted, but often it's translated as pride. We see in Isaiah 10, 33, Behold the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the high ones of stature, and that's not necessarily physically, it's used in a symbolic way here, the high ones of stature shall be hewn down, 
and the haughty shall be humbled. And it's referring to people that are prideful. But let's now look on the next slide where this Hebrew word room is clearly and obviously used as pride. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness, that's that same word room that's translated as tall, so it could be, and the tall men shall be bowed down. The haughtiness men, the tall men shall be bowed down. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. The tall men, the giants in that time, were symbols of those that are opposed to God. Opposed to God, they're adversaries of God. They're proud. The loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness, the tallness of men shall be made low. Isaiah 2.17 Psalm 13, how, shall, how long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted or be made tall over me? It's that same word translated as tall. Psalm 131, a song of degrees of David. Again, David is a type of Christ. Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor mine eyes lofty. That word lofty there is that same word tall. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. The giants, their tallness is a symbol of pride. Similarly, the word in the Hebrew for height, which is gaba, we see Goliath of Gath, whose height, his height was six cubits in a span. And we see the same word height, which is this word gaba in the Hebrew. King Saul, they ran and fetched him, and when he stood among the people, he was higher, or his height, his high, highness, than any other people from his shoulder and upwards. Amos 2.9, yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars. The Amorite was an enemy of God's people in, in the promised land. Their height was like the height of cedars. In other words, their, their highness... And he was strong as the oaks, and I destroyed the fruit from above and his roots from beneath. So let's on the next slide, we're going to look at verses where the same word, Gaba, is translated as pride. And we see Ezekiel 16, they were haughty. They were haughty. They were height. They were high and committed abomination before me. There I took them away as I saw good. Ezekiel 21, thus says the Lord God, remove the diadem, take off the crown, this shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. His height. And it's, it's used in a spiritual sense here about pride and haughtiness. The prince of Tyre, which is, by the way, the type of the Antichrist. By thy great wisdom and by your merchandise and you have increased thy riches and your heart is lifted up. It's made high because of your riches. People, when they become rich, the rich people of this world today, they're haughty. They become high. They think they're better. They think they're above the law. They think they can do what they want. They manipulate. They take advantage of the poor. They're selfish. The king, the prince of Tyre is a type of Antichrist. The king of Tyre is a type of Satan. Thine heart was lifted up in the, against that same height, that same Hebrew word, Gaba. Thine heart was lifted up and made high because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I will cast you to the ground or lay before kings that they may behold you. That's pointing to Satan. Satan is prideful. The Antichrist is prideful. Tallness or height is a symbol or used as pride spiritually. Just a quick summary about the spiritual meaning of giants in the Bible. Yes, they sure existed. They were literal giants like Goliath and King Og. There's been giants even recently in the world. They're documented. They were called Nephilim, Anakim, and Rephaim, which are all equated in the King James Version in the Old Testament as giants. Because they all pointed to the same thing. They're all relating to each other. They were giants. They were those who were great and tall and powerful and mighty men of renown. And this symbolizes, this symbolizes the adversaries of God's people who are proud, they're mighty, it, because it's, they're based on the human ability. It's those those people in today that are are have all these abilities to do things, where it's political or religious or civic or entertainment or sports or whatever avenue. They're people that 
are ungodly though. They're proud, they're mighty, they're famous, they're men of renown. They're, they're spiritually tall, high, which has to do with the pride of human ability. It's all about what they can do and what they can offer. Giants in pride, they exist today. They're the pride, proud, mighty adversaries of God's people. We're going to move on. The next video is really important. It's what is the spiritual meaning of those Nephilim giants in the days of Noah? We're going to talk about prophecy. It's an important prophetic lesson because it relates to the Great Tribulation. It relates to things that are, that are going to be happening in this world. Please consider subscribing to this channel. And thank you very much for watching this video.